Hello there. Hello there, you're tuned into 7 edition. I'm Muhammad Mohamdan and these are tonight's top stories. The VIP exposed for committing security breach at KLIA. Exam board denies SPM papers were leaked. And 18 tonnes of cocaine seized from Eastern Pacific Ocean. Good evening. The government is steadfast in its pledge to uphold the rule of law and for this, the Transport Minister wants Tansri S.A. Vignes Warren to tender a public apology for breaching protocols at the VIP lounge at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport, KLIA. Anthony Lok Siu Fook also said the Prime Minister will decide on the cause of action against the Dewan Negara President. The protocol breach issue prompted the Transport Minister to call for a media conference today. A security footage of the incident was also played to media members, with several staff on duty individually explaining about the incident. The Minister then disclosed that Tan Sri Vigneswaran, who is also MIC President, not only violated the mandatory dress code when accessing the Premier Lounge, but also rebuked on-duty staff who had explained the protocol and refused to be body searched. No, number one, dress code, I would say, is a minor mistake. Though. The dress code is a minor mistake, a slipper. I mean, he will was, he was argue, just a slipper. Yes, it's a minor mistake. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the, what they call it, it's just tidak mematuhi etika pemakaian. But the problem is that, kalau ada pegawai bagi tahu, you cannot go in. Then you give... Give cooperation, nah. You hantar anak je. I mean, you can just send off goodbye there. Not, not, not much difference. Yeah. It's just another few hundred meter. Yeah. It's just probably another 10, 5, 15 minutes. Yeah. Yes, you just you can send off the children. <laughs> you can send off your passengers at the main lobby. You can just say bye, goodbye, and send off. But the question, the issue here is that it's encroachment. Lok said that when the case was forwarded to him, he viewed it as a very serious case because the VVIP had demonstrated a bad example. Please respect the rule of law. This is new Malaysia. Ini bukan kerajaan lama dah. Kalau kerajaan lama tidak mengambil tindakan yang tegas, that is in the past. Ini kerajaan baru, kita nak uphold the rule of law. The minister also said that he had exposed the incident due to transparency and stressed that it had nothing to do with Tan Sri Vigneswaran being a representative from the opposition. So in the past, of course, I'm not sure whether anybody will strip off before, but I'm not saying that I'm, I have the power to strip off uh, his privilege to use the VIP lane, but we will, we will tender this report, we will give this report, a full report, to the PM's department, uh, because there is a specific uh, department handling uh, the movement and usage of uh, we we are pilings. That is a bahagian istiadat, uh, istiadat nan. Istiadat urus setia persidangan antarabangsa. Bahagian istiadat urus setia persidangan antarabangsa. Biopa. So Biopa is a department under the PM's department. So I will definitely send this report, tender this report, full report. I ask the MHB to give a full report to Biopa and also to the Prime Minister. It was exactly a month ago on October 17th that the Transport Minister announced that control will be tightened at VIP lanes in airports nationwide to prevent VIPs and politicians from abusing their privilege. Meanwhile, the Dewan Negara president has denied breaching security protocols at the VIP area of the KLIA. He told several media outlets today that he tried to contact Lok to clear the, the air on the matter. He also claimed that he did go through the body check and was cleared by the officers on duty. Tan Sri Vignes Warren also said that Lok did not contact him for a clarification on the issue. Moving on, the Education Ministry has dismissed news about a leak of the Bahasa Melayu, Mathematics and Chinese Language test papers for the ongoing Sijil Pelajaran Malaysia SPM examination. The examination board in a statement today said that it has already conducted investigations into complaints received on the matter. Following the probe, the board gave its assurance that there is no need for candidates to receive the papers. 
The statement also said parents and guardians too need not worry as the examination is being conducted in accordance with the guidelines of the board under the supervision of the state education departments and district education officers. The board also advised the people not to spread fake news, saying this can adversely affect the focus and emotions of the examination candidates and their parents. The 2018 SPM examination began on November 13th and is scheduled to run until December 13th. Now, 2,446 out of 5,000 policemen who retired this year up to October had opted for early retirement, while the rest had gone on mandatory retirement. This has become a major concern for the police force as the trend of early retirement among police officers and personnel was seen as alarming. Inspector General of Police Tansri Mohamed Fuzi Harun said in general there has been a sharp rise in early retirement or optional retirement over the past five years. Jadi kalau sampai akhir tahun ni kita jangka jumlah ni akan meningkat lebih daripada itulah. Uh, jadi ini perkara yang kita amat bimbang lah maknanya kalau campur yang besara pilihan sendiri ni dengan yang apa ni besara wajib lebih daripada 5000 setiap tahun. Jadi kita untuk mengimbangi keadaan, kita mesti membuat pengambilan. Dan uh, saya dah sebut tadi pada tahun ini kita kita punya jangkaan kita akan dapat mengambil kira-kira 7000 rekrut-rekrut baru. He also said among the reasons given for early retirement include taking care of ailing family members, work pressure and personal health problems, adding that the police is investigating the issue further to find a solution. He also said the early retirement is having an adverse impact on the police force because it is losing high-ranking staff as well as experienced personnel. In another development, the top cops at police have already conducted investigation into the alleged death threats involving former Cradle Fund Syndrome Berhad Chief Executive Officer Nazrin Hassan. Tansri Muhammad Fuzi also revealed they have already submitted the investigation papers to the Deputy Attorney General's Chambers for further action. Oh, yang ugutan tu ada laporan polis dibuat. Uh, kalau saya tak silap, ada empat laporan polis dibuat dan laporan tu kita dah siasat. Ya kemudian uh, arwah uh, si mati ni dia telah menarik balik laporan yang dia buat tu tapi macam mana pun pihak kita dah mengumumkan kertas sesatan kepada pihak DPP jadi uh, kita tak dapat apa-apa arahan untuk buat tuduhan dan sebagainya jadi kita akan tunggulah There had been reports that Nazri had received death threats three months before his murder and that he had reported the matter to police probe revealed that the threats had come in the form of telephone calls from his close relative. The IGP also said police have yet to receive the report of Nazarene's second post-mortem. Police investigations into the One Malaysia Development Berhad 1MDB case is expected to be fully completed within one or two months. Deputy Inspector General of Police Tansri Nur Rashid Ibrahim said at present, the police are still preparing the investigation papers before handing it over to the AGC for further action. So, sekarang ini kita siasatan masih berjalan dan uh, seperti mana yang saya katakan tadi, kalau dapat disiapkan dalam masa yang terdekat, kita akan rujukkan kertas siasatan ini dalam masa yang terdekat. So, hopefully dalam satu dua bulan ini. He also said the police would call several other individuals from companies linked to 1MDB to give their statements. Prime Minister Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad called on Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation APEC member countries and trade organizations to realize that the age of technological disruption requires a fairer and more genuine cooperation between developed and developing countries. Speaking at the APEC CEO Summit 2018 in Port Moresby earlier today, Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad cautioned that the set disruption was leaving some member country behind, fueling inequality which is bad for growth and social stability.
APEC should also promote the concept of shared prosperity among its member states. I believe in the adage, prosper thy neighbor and not beggar thy neighbor. Everyone gains from the former, while only one gains from the latter. The Prime Minister also stressed that only a win-win concept among APEC members will allow the region to chart a common and inclusive future in the age of disruption. The Premier is on a two-day official visit to Papua New Guinea for the economic leaders' meeting. Meanwhile, Tun Dr Mahate also said that member countries will need to adjust to changes and from there build new partnerships and agreements to suit them. He added that the amount of time required for the implementation of changes comes as the main concern in order for them to be effective in this new and uncharted frontier. History has shown that nations which respond quickly to disruption with systematic and coherent strategies for its citizenry had always been able to ride the wave of radical changes. During his 30-minute speech session, Tun Dr Mahathir went on to share Malaysia's four key policies that will form the basis for a more inclusive and equitable development in the advent of disruption. This is done through the introduction of policies and programs that include new educational approaches, more scholarships for professionals and postgraduate studies, as well as latest technological programs for youths. Secondly, he said policy must also take care of taxi drivers and displaced workers who are losing out to disruptive technologies. He added that the policy must encourage these people to be retrained and rehired. Thirdly, the capacity must be built to face the disruption, such as investment in 5G infrastructure, which can be facilitated by multilateral organizations. And fourthly, building cooperation at the international level, which includes the need to re-evaluate trade globalization and economic integration. Now, in the first of his two-day APEC summit in Port Moresby today, the Prime Minister also held bilateral meetings with two of his counterparts. First was Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, where the meeting lasted for about 30 minutes and joined by government officials from both sides. Some of the issues discussed were on bilateral cooperation in trade and economy. The Prime Minister then met with Hong Kong's Special Administrative Region Chief Executive Carrie Lum. In the meeting, Dr. Mahave also thanked Hong Kong for providing 400 scholarships to Malaysian students. In the evening, Tun Dr. Mahave, along with other leaders, convened for the APEC 2018 summit at the APEC House. They were welcomed by summit chairman Peter O'Neill, who is also the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. This was followed by a photo session of the APEC family. The summit's, first day, the summit's first day then proceeded with a dialogue session with the APEC Business Advisory Council, ABAC, and concluded with dialogues between members, heads of states and leaders of the Pacific Island nations. The day's events will culminate with a formal dinner with cultural performances for the leaders before the summit continues tomorrow. We come to complete our first year of chairing APEC. And coming up after the break, girl jumps onto train tracks as a joke. Stay tuned. Welcome back. An emotional Dato Sri Dr. Wan Aziza Wan Ismail today delivered her final presidential speech after leading PKR since its inception at the party's 13th National Congress. She was seen wiping her tears several times when addressing some 2,000 delegates as she emphasized to party members to hold on to the reformacy spirit. Among her message, never underestimate the reform agenda, as PKR was born out of the struggle, sweat and tears of the people. Kita harus iktiraf dan hargai para reformis yang berjuang sejak 1998. Mereka hilang kerja akibat dibuang dan dipecat. 
Mereka jatuh bankrap akibat gagal membayar hutang membiayai perjuangan. Mereka cedera dipukul, dihina, dicaci, diseksa, dilokap, dipenjara dan berbagai penderitaan yang dilalui. Namun mereka tegar berdiri menyatakan yang hak kepada pemimpinnya rakus dan zalim. She said 2004 was the most trying for her as she was all alone in parliament. She also reminded party members not to allow the incident to repeat itself after PKR only won one seat in the general election. Asas perjuangan kita menegakkan yang hak menentang yang batil bukan kerana manusia, pangkat atau harta. Saya inginkan setiap dari kita mengakhiri kehidupan kita dengan kebaikan. InsyaAllah. Ingatlah, ada yang memerhati kita setiap langkah dan laku kita dalam gelap dan terang. After helming the role of PKR president for 20 years, Atut Sri Dr. Wanaziza said it is high time to hand over the party which is in its best position in history to Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim. Now, during a press conference later, Dato Sri Anwar said the party's election process, which had been marred by allegations of money politics and scuffles, will be scrutinized once he officially takes over as party president. He also said that in his personal capacity, he had been very critical of the party election from the very beginning. The Port Dixon MP added it was imperative to conduct the party polls in a professional and competent manner because it involved some one million voters. Now you ask my personal view, I think we have to really look at it. I'm not personally too keen, but the um, party is a democratic party. So which means we have to have signed a team to review that, make recommendations to the leadership, whether to proceed in this process or not. What I would propose um, later, <laughs> once I take over, is probably to, for a special committee to review the entire electoral process. The Dato Sri Anwar said this to the media at the Ideal Convention Center in Shah Alam, where the PKR National Congress is being held. He's scheduled to deliver the adjournment speech as the incoming president at about 4 p.m. tomorrow. At the media conference, Dato Sri Anwar was also asked about the vacancy for the Rantau state seat in Negeri Sembilan following the election court's decision yesterday. He said he is not ruling out the possibility of fielding a fresh face if a by-election is held. So a new candidate is possible? Yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, nothing is definite for now. Why are you, you are proposing anybody? Do you think the Rapta Ji will be a good candidate? Yeah. Good candidate. Yeah. You want him to be in the Adun? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Since he I I'm is sure he's, now. he is uh, more qualified than that. Dato Sri Anwar also spoke about the party's polls, which concluded just yesterday with Dato Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali, who was challenged by Rafizi Ramli, retaining the PKR number two post. So I appealed to the party leaders uh, last week, uh, no, last Tuesday, to suggest that let's move on, uh, we accept the results. And fortunately, in this case, uh, Rafizi said, OK, we concede. Garakan has been urged to show support to the government in ratifying the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, or ICERD. The party's outgoing youth chief, Tan Keng Liang, said ICERD's objectives are good and backing the move would prove that the country is progressive. According to Tan, the Pakatan Harapan government would be moving in the right direction by ratifying the convention as it eliminates all forms of racial discrimination as should be practiced by a democratic country. Janganlah kita mendengar fitnah-fitnah tertentu. Saya terdengar bau-bau ini. Ketua Pemuda AMNO yang baru. Dia kata kalau ICERD Dimetraikan maka sekolah rendah Cina, sekolah rendah Tamil akan ditutup juga kerana ICRD. Saya rasa ini adalah tidak benar. 
Skola Vida China, Skola Vida Tamil Mana, the Kina, the Kina, the ICRD, Gana Ice, Gana Skola Skola, the Nadula, the Masu Skola Gama, Adala Sotu Skola Yang, Manarima, Sumo Kao, Tiada Uso Pokauma, Yang Babesa, Adala Skola, the Sabot, Mangaja, the Big Domu, Dan Mubanaka, or Uto Blaja, Basa, Basa China, Tamil, Atapur. Speaking at the Garakhan's 47th Wanita and Youth Conference at the PGRM Tower in Chiras this morning, Tan added that all countries have ratified ICERT except Myanmar, Angola, North Korea and Malaysia. Meanwhile, the party's deputy president, Dr. Dr. Chia Soon Hai, in his opening speech also mirrored the same stance with Tan. <laughs> ICERD tidak kena semua itu um, menyokong ICERD the International Convention on the Elimination of All Form of Racial Discrimination itu dalam dalam konteks perlembagaan Malaysia we have fully support so we hope that the kerajaan ke depan dengan itu uh, itu boleh memberi ini dan uh, menyokong itu apa yang itu patut dibuat Yesterday, thousands of people joined rallies held in several states to protest against ICERD, which were organized by non-governmental organizations, NGOs, PAS and AMNO. Now let's head into our daily segment, Clickbait, where we take a look at what's trending and making rounds in the cyber world today. As some might say, a relationship without fights or arguments becomes a boring and a very bland one, a void of emotional expression. In a way, it's healthy to argue to strengthen such relationships, but not to an extent that could jeopardize one's life. A woman in China earlier this week thought it was funny to jump onto a train track just to scare her boyfriend during an argument. Shocking footage shows the 33-year-old woman named Wang, dressed in black, running away from the platform at the Nanjing South Railway South Station and jumping onto the tracks. A train swiftly approached seconds later. Luckily for Wang, passersby immediately pulled her off the tracks and the train came to a stop right in front of her. Speaking to authorities, a woman explained that she did it as a joke to scare her boyfriend because they had been fighting. Outrageous. The woman was later scolded by police officers for her rash act and was fined 200 yuan after it delayed the high-speed train bound for Zuzhou. After the footage went viral on China's social media platforms, netizens on Weibo harshly criticized her immature act. Now updated as of 7 p.m. here are the top trending topics and searches on the internet today. And when we return, report reveals CIA's conclusion on Jamal Khashoggi's assassination. Details next. Welcome back to the foreign front. At least two people were killed and ten others injured in a bomb blast in Pakistan's southern port city of Karachi late on Friday. Authorities say the blast took place under a bridge near a crowded area of the locality where several vendors had set up their stalls. The powerful explosion, which could be heard from a distance, disrupted power supply to the surrounding areas. The nature of the blast was not known and police has launched an investigation into the incident. In another case, shortly after, the bomb disposal squad found another bomb nearby weighing 400 to 500 grams, which was successfully diffused in a nearby ground. Police have yet to link the two cases.
Authorities in the U.S. have seized a whopping 500 million U.S. dollars worth of cocaine, an equivalent of just over 2 billion ringgit in the eastern Pacific Ocean. On Friday, the cocaine weighing over 18,000 kilograms was taken off the Coast Guard Cutter James in Fort Lauderdale a day earlier after it was confiscated from 15 drug smuggling vessels across international waters. Multiple U.S. Coast Guard cutters helped seize the drugs from Mexico, Central and South America. It was reported that some 49 suspects were also arrested and will be prosecuted in southern Florida. From our Hitron unit, uh, the helicopter that deploys with us, and they uh, can use airborne. Now in California, searchers combing through the ruins of the deadliest wildfire in the state's history found 11 more bodies on Friday, bringing the number of dead in the campfire to 74. Seven of the eight bodies were found in the town of Paradise which was all but destroyed in the fire that broke out on it's November 8th. And the other was in Magalia, north of Paradise. Meanwhile, more than 1,000 people remain unencountered for. The campfire has displaced thousands of people and led to the evacuation of some 52,000 at the fire's peak. About 42,200 remain evacuated as of Friday. The devastating fire has burned nearly 60,000 hectares and was 50% contained. On to journalist Jamal Khashoggi's murder case, the CIA believes that Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman ordered the assassination of Khashoggi in Istanbul, contradicting the Saudi government's claims that he was not involved, according to Washington Post reports. The CIA also concluded, based on several pieces of intelligence, that a team of 15 Saudi agents flew to Istanbul on the government's aircraft in October and killed Khashoggi inside the consulate, where he had come to pick up documents that he needed for his planned marriage to a Turkish woman. Saudi Arabia had insisted that the crown prince knew nothing about plans for the killing. However, U.S. officials think such an operation would not happen without the prince's approval. The assessment, which came from sources familiar with the matter, reported that the CIA had briefed other parts of the U.S. government, complicating President Donald Trump's efforts to preserve ties with a close ally. Both the White House and the State Department have declined to comment further. And that wraps up 7 edition this time around. I'm Muhammad Ahmad Hamdan. Thanks for tuning in and have a splendid weekend.